Okay, everybody. Um, I have a lot of ground to cover, so please, um, I have to start because uh, I have, I think, almost 120 slides. So uh, we have to uh, do a little bit of tempo, tempo. Um, welcome, everybody, to my session uh, where we're going to do a deep dive into Drupal performance. First, let me introduce myself. My name is Sean. Um, I'm Sean B on Drupal.org, and I have been a contributor of Drupal for about 15 years, working with Drupal a little bit longer than that, but at least 15 years I have been on Drupal.org. I'm uh, the maintainer of the media and media library module in Drupal Core, and um, for most of the time I have been a Drupal backend developer, but since a couple of years, I've also started to focus a lot on front-end performance, accessibility, and uh, UX. Um, and uh, since two years, I've started, I've co-founded a company called 12 Bricks, um, where we are uh, providing a Drupal SaaS, uh, where we're also doing like a lot of uh, backend development, but also uh, front-end performance, accessibility, UX, so everything really comes together and um, a part of this and as my client work as a freelancer uh, has been a focus on performance on the whole spectrum. So uh, a part of the lessons I've learned over the last couple of years I wanted to share with you today. First of all, why do we even care about performance? Um, so first of all, a, a faster website that responds quickly when you click on something leads to a better user experience. And an, an increased user experience also increases sales, revenue, and conversion. And uh, that's ultimately what businesses mostly care about. So better websites, more money. Um, if a website responds quickly and does what you think it's supposed to do, it also leads to a positive brand experience, it builds trust for the user, um, so it basically says, we as a company know what we're doing, uh, which of course, as a brand, you should want. Google cares um, about performance, so if, you, if your site is faster than the site of a competitor, there's a chance that you will rank higher. Um, uh, which ultimately leads back to more sales and money. And last but not least, uh, not all the companies care about this, but it's becoming more and more important in today's world. If your site uses less memory, uh, responds better, it, you, it consumes less resources and ultimately leads to a lower carbon footprint and it's better for the environment, uh, which I think is a good thing and we should all as a developer care about that as well. Um, here are some facts I found on the internet. Um, I didn't fact check them, but uh, I'm pretty sure it's true. So Amazon loses about 1% of its 141 billion online sales for every 100 milliseconds of latency. And that's crazy if you think about it. So like 100 milliseconds can lead to billions of losses. Uh, the BBC risks 10% of its website visitors for every additional second of load time. And Google says that a 0.5 second site speed delay can cause a 20% traffic drop. So, it, it matters. So, uh, about performance. Performance is not something that you can turn on and off via a simple checkbox. I wish it was, but it isn't. So, to understand how performance works, we take a look at how a simple request works when a user visits a page in the browser. Uh, so a user enters a URL uh, or it clicks a link, which then sends a request to a server uh, somewhere. On the server we have a web server running, mostly Apache or Nginx. Within the web server we have something um, to process PHP requests for Drupal, uh, like uh, mod PHP or PHP FPM. Um, PHP then executes the Drupal code, in our case, and um, while executing the Drupal code, Drupal calls the database to retrieve data like user information or content, which the database then sends back to Drupal. Drupal creates a response, which it then sends to PHP. PHP uses the web server uh, and the server 
to send a response back to the browser of the user, and the user sees a beautiful web page. Um, as you can see, there are a lot of moving parts here, and today I'm going to focus on all of these separate parts to see what we can do to tweak Drupal, and, or not only Drupal, but also the server, and to, to make sure that the performance of a, a web page is as good as possible. First, the server. Uh, I'm going to skip the browser for now because there's not a lot we can do in tweaking the way the user clicks a link or enters a URL. So we get a request for a URL from the, from the browser and it lands on our server. <coughs> the first thing we can do, uh, and in today's world it's relatively cheap, use proper hardware. Make sure you have a server that has enough CPUs, enough memory, enough disk space, uh, and like I said, it's relatively cheap, so please uh, make sure you have that first because you don't have enough memory to serve all the requests um, you get as a, as a site, then all the rest is pretty much useless. Um, make sure you run Linux for Drupal at least. Uh, Windows is a lot less efficient in serving uh, as a web server to serve PHP requests. So this is also something, if you have a, have a choice between Windows and Linux, choose Linux. Uh, this is also an obvious bomb, but, but some, uh, I see a lot of people forgetting this, is update your server packages. So a lot of the software running your server is uh, continuously developed and upgraded, and a lot of the times a new version of these packages also contain performance improvements. Uh, so it would be foolish not to take use of them. Please update your search practice regularly. It's also for security, by the way. Um, this is another one, optimized disk reads and writes. Um, for uh, the, like the simple thing you can do is make sure you have a server that uses an SSD, which makes it a lot faster to read and write files from, to the server. Um, and when you have like multiple servers, I see NFS mounts as a popular way uh, to, to share files between servers, but NFS mounts can be slow if you don't configure it properly, uh, especially when you have like sh a shared Twig cache files, for example, the, they are read a lot and they, you have a lot of writes to them as well. So if you have a slow <coughs> Twig cache and you add like five milliseconds for each one of the hundreds of uh, Twig cache files that you need to read and write, it can slowly add up and make your pages ridiculously slow. So um, make sure it's properly configured or avoid it uh, when you can. This minimize the network overhead is also something um, that's becoming more and more of a problem in today's world where we have like Kubernetes clusters and uh, sites where you have multiple containers and field overs and stuff like that. When you have a database container that's somewhere else and a memcache container that's somewhere else or a solar server that's somewhere else, there's a, there can be network overhead in the, in the requests that, that are sent from your server to the, to the different backends. And like with the disk read and writes, if each of your database queries has like five millisecond delay and you have 2,000 queries on a single page, well, it adds up. So uh, try to make sure that, the, that all the containers uh, when you use different servers are close together and have a minimal network overhead. Monitor your, monitor your servers uh, because when you measure things you know where the bottlenecks are and you can improve them so there are a lot of monitoring tools for servers out there. Make sure you use them and uh, you can quickly see where the delays are coming from and you can act accordingly. Uh, as to summarize Use proper hardware, make sure you run Linux, update your server packages, optimize, optimize the disk reads and writes, minimize the network overhead between the different servers that run your site, and monitor it all the time to um, act when something becomes slow. The next part in the performance optimization is optimizing the web server. So that's this step in the, in the scheme. 
one of the first things you can easily do is choose Nginx over Apache. Um, there's a lot of debate about this, but the statistics really say that uh, Nginx can run more requests with a lower memory footprint than Apache does. Um, yeah, if, 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 if your site is really a high traffic website, these kind of things matter in the end. Uh, the, I will make sure the slides are online so you can take a look at the graphs in more detail, I can imagine. In the back it's not really readable. But uh, for example, this one here, it's the, like the yellow one is Nginx and the blue one is Apache. So the number of requests per second it can handle is significantly higher. Um, this is a bit technical, but in your web server you have worker processes. Uh, that you can configure and make sure you configure a single worker process per CPU and a worker can handle like 512 connections so if and then it's basic, basic math to figure out I need this many connections then I also need this many uh, CPUs and worker processes to make to, to make sure that uh, the server and the, the processes are matched and then make sure you optimize for the expected number of connections and also don't make it a lot more, don't make it a lot less, just find a good space in between. And make, also make sure to keep the connections alive between the requests. Another simple thing you can do on the web server is basically deny all the requests that do not belong for your site. So, uh, you have might have JSON files, log files, all kinds of different file types that your website really doesn't need to serve, text files for example. If you don't want to serve them, basically deny them at the web server level so they never reach Drupal and you don't use Drupal resources for things that really don't need to be uh, served. Uh, same goes for some URLs, you have a lot of bots out there scanning for a WP admin uh, WordPress kind of pages. If you can deny those at the web server, even better at the firewall before it, but that's something for later. Um, deny them as quickly as possible and don't use resources to serve 404 pages for things that you already know that has nothing to do with Drupal. Um, then if you have a choice to use PHP FPM over mod PHP, if you're using Apache, of course, uh, do it, it's faster. Uh, also here the graphs are, might not be that readable, but um, yeah, mod PHP is just a lot slower than PHP FPM. To summarize again, use Nginx instead of Apache, optimize your worker processes, deny requests as soon as possible, and use PHP FPM if you have the choice of the option. Then, optimizing PHP, uh, we are now here. To optimize PHP in 8.3, I'm not really sure which version, but uh, 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 you have opcode uh, caching and JIT, which make PHP a lot faster. In this graph, so in the left you see the number of uh, times it takes, or like the number of milliseconds it takes without opcache and JIT to serve a request. The middle one is with just opcache and the right one is with opcache and JIT enabled. So if you enable it, you get a lot of uh, speed or performance for free. Only install the necessary modules in PHP uh, so it doesn't spend time doing things that it's not supposed to. For example, never enable xDebug in production. Uh, it's just good to say it out loud, but uh, I hope nobody has ever done it. But I can't imagine, I've, I, I, I did see it once. Um, then also disable database types you're not using and there are uh, a lot of PHP modules that if you don't need them, disable it. Optimize your memory limit, but make sure to be greedy with your resources. So I've seen examples where a Chrome task needs a gigabyte of memory to run. Well, then the easiest thing would be to set your memory, memory limit to one gigabyte, but that also means that each of the requests the user sends to the browser also reserves one gigabyte of memory for your PHP process. And if you have a lot of connections, it can slowly add up while you don't need it. So if you have some tasks that need more memory, 
make sure to increase the memory for those specific tasks and try to be as greedy as possible with your regular PHP request. So if you only need 265 MB, just use, use that. And uh, if you can make it more, make it more, but try to be greedy as possible. The same goes with the number of processes you can configure for PHP. So the more processes you configure, the more connections you can handle. But also here, it reserves uh, space for those processes. So if you don't need 5,000 processes, don't enable 5,000 processes, enable 200. A simple one you can also do is just update to the latest PHP version. It's similar to the server packages. Uh, here, yeah, it's probably not visible, but the blue line is PHP 8.3, and it's uh, about 1.5 times faster than H uh, PHP 8.2 and 8.1. So uh, if you can, just upgrade it. It's a simple um, fix. To summarize, use opcache and JIT where possible. Only install the necessary modules. Optimize your memory limit and number of processes, but be very greedy and reserved while doing it. And update to the latest PHP version. Then we arrive at optimizing Drupal. So that's, that's where we are right here. And before we look at optimizing Drupal, I first want to take a look at optimizing the database since most of the time Drupal is spent is connecting with the database backends. So let's first take a look here. Um, I have two minor tips, or I'll, I'll, come, I'll get to it. Um, first, MariaDB uh, over MySQL. Um, I know my, MySQL is getting a lot better over the years. Uh, and MariaDB is a fork of MySQL which contains a lot of improvements. But in most cases, MariaDB is just faster in handling the same uh, database queries. So uh, try to use it. And uh, since database tuning is a very site-specific um, affair, there is no generic tips I can give you to make sure that your um, database is optimized for your specific site. So there's a MySQL tuner script, run it, use it, and it will give you a lot of recommendations which help in, performing, uh, in, in the performance of your database server. Uh, so use MariaDB and use MySQL tuner if you want to take a look at the database improvements. Another thing you can do to uh, improve your database is simply don't use it. Um, we have things like Memcache and Redis, which you can put besides of your database server, basically, something like this. And it is an open source, in-memory database and cache, useful for application level caching. So what most of the time we use for, uh, in, in relation to Drupal, you put all of your cache information, your cache tables, put it in Memcache or Redis, uh, which it then stores in memory. So anytime you need something from the cache, it will simply talk to Redis or Memcache instead of your database. And Memcache and Redis is a lot more efficient in serving this cached information than your database is. Um, yeah, I've, I've seen like, uh, like a 20 to 30% increase for simply just enabling this. Um, and here is a nice uh, uh, a, a graph. So you can see at the arrow they enabled Redis, for example, and this is the database performance. Well, basically your database from then on is uh, you know, not, not useless, but <laughs> it's not busy. <laughs> so it speeds up cache data and it also can help speeding up your Drupal bootstrap. So the Drupal bootstrap is loading all your configuration, uh, loading user information, loading your translations when uh, Drupal starts, a request starts, and, it's, and it, it has to be done every request. So if you can improve that by caching parts of this information in Memcache or Redis, uh, every request becomes a lot faster. So it's a relatively simple change with, a, with big performance benefits. And here are the modules for the Memcache and Redis modules. The documentation is pretty good, so uh, if you can follow the documentation, you will uh, probably be able to get it running. This is also a thing, uh, using Apache Solar is, yeah, if you don't need a database, 
for things or can or you can use something that's better at the database for doing something then Apache Solar is a great benefit for building um, uh, overviews. You can also put it next to the database and it's an open source search server built on Apache Lucene and it's just great and much better than the database at searching stuff. So you type in a keyword and you want to see all the content related to the keyword. Uh, Apache Solar is built specifically to do this and do this well. Um, and if you can build a lot of the views in your site on top of Solar instead of the database, uh, not only is Solar more efficient at it, but your database has more time to do other things which Solar can do. So if you use specific tools for specific jobs, um, yeah, it, it, it becomes a lot more efficient. And here's, uh, yeah, so uh, a, a, a kind of an overview on where when you start using uh, Apache Solar, the, the, the database becomes a lot less busy and even Redis and Memcache become a lot less busy. Um, I think later today there's a session about Apache Solar as well. I think I saw her somewhere. But um, make sure to visit it because it's a very interesting topic and uh, it's good to know more about it. The search API and the search API Solar modules can help you do it. Uh, then we arrive at Drupal and how to optimize Drupal. So what happens when Drupal receives a request? So you, uh, so the web server sends a request and creates a, re a request object, and Drupal creates a request object using Symfony. Um, it then tries to resolve the request to a controller, uh, which is basically a piece of code, like for example, render a node detail page. Uh, then it resolves the controller arguments. Uh, so if you visit node slash four, the controller argument is 4 and it needs to know to load node number 4 to uh, create the detail page. It then executes the controller, uh, in this case to render the detail page of node number 4. Um, after the controller builds a response, the response is being rendered. Uh, and the rendered response is uh, again a symphony object which is then returned to the web server. So we can visit, serve it to the users. For now, we are mostly going to focus on executing controllers and rendering responses since receiving requests, resolving arguments, and returning responses is mostly a symphony thing which you don't really have to do a lot about. It's pretty good. So let's focus for now on what you can do to make your uh, controller execution and response rendering better. Building responses. So the first thing I advise anybody to do is when you build custom pages or, or blocks or whatever, minimize the number of entity loads. Uh, a good example would be I want to see all the um, content that's related to a taxonomy term that's also in my user profile. For that, I only need the ID of the taxonomy terms that are in the user profile. I don't need to load the entire term. So when you don't need to load an entire term entity, just fetch the target ID of the specific taxonomy term and do a query with the target ID only. So minimize the number of entity loads. Uh, loading entities consumes memory. They are cached, uh, which helps with performance, but they are also statically cached, which means that your, uh, the memory that, need, that is needed to serve a page will also increase with each entity load. And if you are not thinking about this when you're doing it, it can slowly become bigger and bigger and bigger until you need to increase your PHP memory limit, which means every request will need more memory limit and yeah, because it's like a snowball effect. It's also very heavy on a cold cache, like if you have large entities with a lot of fields, each of the view values are stored in a separate database table. So if you want to load an entity that has 50 fields, it has to do a lot of database queries or complex joints to get all the data together. Uh, which, of course, is bad for performance. So only load what you actually need. And another uh, WTF I found recently is that the load revision method does not use cache. So we had a layout builder page where each of the blocks were loading an entity and we wanted to check with the latest revision um, which data we wanted to use. So if we had like 20 blocks, 
we did 20 times a call to load revision. Well, we found out it didn't use cache, so my number of database queries for that single page was like 900. And once I uh, found the patch in this issue, it reduced the number of queries to like 200. And uh, the, the page load time went from 1.3 seconds to 0.2 seconds. So even if you use core APIs and core data, please make sure that everything is cached properly and that when you do build stuff, keep, a, keep track of the number of queries that it's doing. So when you in increase the number of queries by accident, thinking you're doing everything right, you, like, the faster you find out, the, more, the easier it is to do something about it. Statically cached data. So um, when you're building custom services, helper functions, whatever, and you are calling, uh, for example, getting the taxonomy terms related to a user profile. You might need it in the block, you might need it somewhere in your teaming layer, uh, then you might need it in your controller, so you're doing four or five calls fetching that taxonomy term from the user profile. Uh, that would be a nice time to introduce something like a service that, which can statically cache the information. So you don't need to execute the database queries four or five times. You can just do it once, statically cache it, and your, your page becomes faster. Um, Dries mentioned it in this uh, presentation this morning. Uh, Drupal has a fantastic system for cache tags and cache contexts. Um, so make sure you use it right. Uh, it's, it really helps you if you start learning more a lot about it. Um, so cache context basically say um, this piece of uh, information, for example, you have a node and you want to render it, but you have a teaser view mode and you have a full view mode and maybe you have a sidebar view mode. The cache context will, will add the view mode so when you render it, it knows that the sidebar uh, rendering is different from the teaser rendering and the teaser rendering is different from the full rendering. Um, it helps you uh, cache things, but not too strict, for example. And then um, there's also mistakes you can make. For example, there are some dangerous cache contexts, like user, route, route params, and URL. If you add those, your, your cache only works for that specific URL or that specific user. And make sure you only use it when you actually need it. It, it might be easy to fix a caching issue by slapping a URL on it, but then each URL which may use the same thing uh, will still cache it separately. So it can be dangerous and you can even break your page caching with this. So be very careful. Um, and also when you use um, entities to build a response or build a piece of HTML or uh, a render array, add the entities that you use as caching information. Like the taxonomy example, when you use a profile, when you load the taxonomy term, and you, you want the, the label to be updated in your content whenever the taxonomy term changes, make sure to add the taxonomy term as a cacheable dependency to your render array to, so it is actually updated when needed. Um, optimizing render arrays. So for dynamic data, let's say we have a block in the top of your page that prints the username. A very simple example. Every user that logs in has a different username, so that would mean the page becomes uncacheable as a whole. For that, Drupal I thought of um, the big pipe module and using lazy builders for that. So you can basically say this specific block, I only want to render it after the complete response is built, so you can build complete page response without this block, send it to the browser, and then when the response is sent, it will execute the lazy builders and pop in the dynamic pieces of information. So the page will still be cacheable and only the dynamic parts will uh, be slower, basically. And for things that can load concurrently, we built uh, the Ajax placeholder module that's pretty similar to the uh, big pipe and lazy builders, uh, only it loads concurrently. So uh, the big pipe blocks will still load sequentially, and the Ajax placeholder will just send 10 Ajax requests, and whenever each something comes back, 
it will pop the data in wherever it needs it, which is nice for building things like a dashboard. We had a user dashboards with like 20 different blocks, and each block didn't really have a relation with other blocks, so we just said, just send out 10 requests to load all the blocks, and just whenever something is done, pop it in. And the Ajax placeholder module that we wrote helps you do that. So please check it out if you want. Shameless plug here. <laughs> Um, so to summarize, we trees try to minimize the entity loads, statically cache as much data as you can, implement proper cache tags and context, but not and, and be careful with uh, some of them, and optimize your render arrays. So then we go to the la rendering layer of Drupal, and there is a number of things you can do there as well. Um, first one that I really, uh, uh, was an eye-opener for me, is that Drupal uses Twig to render information. So when you have a node, for example, with 20 fields, and you configure them nicely in your uh, view mode, and use a formatter for them, it will create ugly HTML for you. Why? Because you have a template on the field level, you have sometimes you have a template on the formatter level, then you have a template on the node level, and all these templates can quickly add up. To render a simple node, might use 50 templates, for example. So what I now do is I make the view modes empty and use the node template only to render everything. So we don't use all the Twig templates beneath them. And there are like uh, Twig helper modules. Uh, I think the Twig tweets module could help you pop in information that needs more complex rendering. But um, thinking about things like this, especially when you have a slow disk, read and write, for example, when the Twig cache becomes slower, these things matter. Enable Twig cache. Uh, I already mentioned it a couple of times. You can enable it in the services YAML file. Um, on production, you always want it on. And also want the debugging off on production as well. On your local environment, I don't care. Uh, just make sure that you check for it when something doesn't look as expected. Small debugging tip. Um, then the page cache and the dynamic page cache modules, they're in core. Use them. Um, they make the, the HTML the responses a lot faster, so you don't need to execute the same thing twice. And uh, there is an HTTP cache control module that also helps you uh, configure better cache lifetimes for your pages. So you can not only configure how long can a browser cache this information, but also like uh, the edge caches, for example, if you use things like Varnish or Cloudflare, um, you can configure, have, have a little bit more fields to configure the cache lifetimes of your response. So please check it out. Uh, then another WTF I found was um, the page cache query ignore module. So the page cache uses the um, URL parameters as it takes it into account while building about ca while trying to determine if it can cache a response. And we had a client that was using a lot of social media campaigns, so they had all these nice UTM parameters, and which basically means our page cache didn't work because each time the UTM parameter changed, it, it, was, it was cached differently. Um, so if, it, it, please make sure that you only um, vary the page cache by query parameters that actually make changes in the page itself. So if you have a search page, you definitely want to vary the cache by the search key parameter, but a UTM parameter, it doesn't really make sense. I actually learned it this year while I'm working 15 years with Drupal, so I'm kind of ashamed about that as well. Um, so reduce the number of Twig templates, make sure you enable Twig cache and disable Twig debugging in production, and use the page cache and dynamic page cache modules. Um, then we get back to the, with the responses to our web server. Um, for the responses, we can do a couple of things to improve performance, like uh, caching static files. If you have images, if you have CSS, JavaScript, etc., uh, you can cache it. 
You also use proper cache lifetimes for that, CSS and JavaScript, etc. It doesn't change that much. So, um, yeah, make sure you can cache it for about a year. And if you need it, you can add like a, a cache buster query parameter or something to make sure um, you can bust through it when you do a new deploy of your code. I have to go a bit faster, I'm seeing so. Uh, GZIP, the responses. Um, yeah, it's just easier for a browser to uh, handle GZIP responses. And uh, when possible, enable HTTP2 or HTTP3. Uh, it, they are a lot more efficient in uh, um, sending responses back to the, to the client. So um, yeah, please use it if, if possible. To summarize again, uh, cache static files, use proper cache lifetimes, gzip the responses, and use HTTP2 and HTTP3. Then, uh, normally we would say we send the request back to the browser, but uh, I also want to mention things like varnish, which you can put kind of in between your uh, browser and your server. Uh, varnish is a HTTP reverse proxy that works by cache caching frequently requested web pages. So it only works for anonymous users, that's good to know. Um, but it basically, when a request is sent, it, it will first arrive at Varnish. Varnish will say, hey, I already sent this response. Here, I can give you the response directly. And if not, it will go through everything we just talked about. And when the response comes back, Varnish keeps a copy. So when the next user comes, it will be much faster. So all the traffic that doesn't have to hit your server is basically kept out. Uh, same thing goes for using a CDN. Um, a CDN can even, you can even use Farnish and a CDN together, but for now you can use a CDN instead of Farnish as well. Uh, it's a content delivery network which basically does the same thing as Farnish does, but it, only, but it also has a benefit of caching the data uh, close to the user. So if you have an American user, it will serve something from the uh, American uh, cache and if a European user can, in ca uh, can provide the data from the European servers. And things like Cloudflare, Flashly, Fastly, and Google Cloud CDN are services that provide this. Um, but make sure when you do this, you use efficient purging. So when the user updates its content, uh, we need to send a, a request or some message to Varnish or the CDN that the page has changed and the cache is no longer valid. Uh, the purge module helps you do that, but it's fairly important to configure that well because users will see outdated content if you don't use it properly. Then optimizing the front end, well, you, you can basically fill a whole talk about this on its own, but uh, I will go to the, to the quick wins for now. Um, make sure you minimize says as a JavaScript, Drupal has a core module for it, which has become more efficient since Drupal 10.2. Um, and something I also try to do when building new sites is uh, make sure the front end components do not no, no longer use jQueries or other libraries that you don't really need. Uh, JavaScript has come a long way since uh, when we first started using jQuery, so try to write vanilla JS as a tip. Only load libraries when used, so if you don't render a hero component, don't load the CSS and JavaScript for your hero component. Try to couple the libraries to the components that actually need the CSS and JavaScript. This will also reduce the CSS and JavaScript load for your page. And uh, another tip I can also give you is to try to use CSS utilities so you don't have to duplicate a lot of the styles. So if you have like a heading style that you use for your cards and for persons and stuff like that, write a heading utility class that you can slap on the different components so you don't have to duplicate the CSS everywhere. Mixins help you do it, but it's even better when it's not even in the code. The minimize HTML mod module uh, helps you minimize the HTML responses. Uh, Gzip helps with this as well, so you might not need it, but it's also like a simple module that uh, helps a little bit. Um, serve responsive images, they make a huge difference. Uh, like one of my clients had a 1.8 megabyte homepage when using JPEGs and stuff like that. So by simply switching to WebP files, it, it, it reduces to like 700K, so it helps a lot. Use modern formats and lazy load images, videos, and iframes whenever possible. So if not, so something is not directly in the viewport, lazy load it. 
Uh, here's a bunch of modules that help. Uh, and sh another shameless plug is the Easy Responsive Images module. Um, I, I built that to help you create responsive images for your pages, and it's very nice. Check it out, please. I have to uh, move quickly, I think, uh, a couple of minutes. Uh, preload all the important assets, so things like fonts and even a header image that you show in, in, directly in the viewport. Preload it so the browser already has it when the, when the page needs to be rendered. Um, optimize your fonts as well. So one of the things I regularly see is that designers use four different font weights, weights and for each of the font weights you need a different font file. And if a font file is 200K, uh, you need 800K uh, in fonts. So if you can get a designer to only use two weights, like simply bold and regular, you can reduce 400K easily just by talking to your designer which is a lot harder than it make it sound good. <laughs> <laughs> um, use uh, Wolf 2 files, they are supported everywhere, so please do that. And another tip is you can subset your font. So if your font supports maybe uh, some kind of uh, the critic languages or um, uh, Chinese, for example, and you don't need it in your site, you can subset your font so the font file is reduced by not having characters that you don't use. Uh, so, in general, minimize CSS and JavaScript, minimize HTML, serve responsive images, and preload important assets, and optimize your fonts. Then going the extra mile is adding a proper firewall. Uh, if the firewall can stop bad traffic, your server doesn't have to handle it, please try to do it. It reduces your server load. The Fast 404 module is another thing. Uh, if you have a lot of bots crawling your site and visiting all kinds of pages that don't exist, the Fast 404 module will help you build a response quicker without bootstrapping the entire uh, your Drupal, uh, which uh, yeah, it needs a lot less memory to serve for four pages. Um, and run your cron tests on efficient times. We have the ultimate cron module to make sure that cron tests do not need to run every 15 minutes. Some can only run once a day. Uh, this helps you configure the cron task for each of the modules and reduce database logging. So uh, logging to the database, like every four or four is logged, a, a, a warnings, notices, errors are logged. Please fix all your notices and warnings to reduce the number of database logs. And even try to, even better is use syslog to not log to the database, but log to your system and use some other tools to view your logs. Database logging is really expensive. It's uh, an overlooked part. Do not use the statistics module. Uh, I'm not really sure if people actually use it, but please don't. And also disable other unused modules. Uh, if you don't need it, turn it off. The cache warmer module is also a quick tip you can use, so make sure that the pages are uh, pre-executed pre, uh, before a user visits them, and when the user gets there, they don't have to wait a second. They can get it in maybe 200 milliseconds from the varnish cache, for example, because the cache warmer already primed it. It, uh, it's a very helpful module. So add a proper firewall, use Fast 404, um, run cron efficiently, reduce database logging, uh, disable unused modules, and use cache warming. Then the last three slides, I think I almost made it. Um, when you do see performance issues, how can you investigate them? Well, the first thing is Take a look at your Chrome debugger. Uh, it can give you a lot of helpful information. How big are your responses? How much time is spent uh, sending the response to the server? How much time is spent on the server building the response? And how much time did it actually take to render it in the browser? So the Chrome, Chrome debug tools really help. Uh, when the client wants to pay for it, uh, it, it always helps to use something like New Relic or Blackfire. It can really monitor your PHP processes in detail so you know, for example, this specific function is called 16 times and it takes uh, 30 uh, milliseconds every time or it takes 200 milliseconds every time and you really know exactly where to look for performance issues. And um, something that I also use a lot is Symfony Profiler. For example, this helped me figure out I had a bug in the load revision thing. Uh, here you see, uh, well, if you zoom in, you see that there were 912 queries in 1.3 seconds, and after I applied the patch, there were 227 queries in 0 0.2 seconds. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's an easy module you can just turn on 
and uh, help you investigate issues. Um, so, uh, I think I've already made it. Thank you so much for listening to me. There's a lot of time to talk. Uh, uh, are there any questions? Um, I'll make sure to uh, contact the organization uh, and they help me share the slides. And um, also follow me on LinkedIn and I will share there. Sean Gromart. <laughs> Any more questions? Or uh, you can also have a talk. Oh, there's a question. Sorry? Um, who? Uh, I, I would have to think, I think I need to teach a little bit more about your specific use case, but um, we can talk in the hallway maybe. I think a lot of people need coffee. Um, sorry, yeah, no, uh, I, I, I talked too long. <laughs> uh, please come talk to me if you want any tips or tricks or whatever. Thank you.